Okay, let's call to order the regular business meeting for the Board of Education for Monday, November 12th. If I could ask everybody to stand and please recite the Pledge of Allegiance. Thanks, Dr. Absent uh, this evening. All right, our agenda. Uh, we will open it up for public comment. I hope you didn't all come to speak tonight. Um, <laughs> then uh, we'll have some, uh, a lot of student recognition, and then uh, two presentations I'm excited to see. One is on the AP Environmental Science Butler Lake investigation, uh, which I know I read a little bit about. And then um, we will have a, a presentation about the D128 Daring mission statement, me measuring what matters. Uh, we'll have updates from our student school board representatives, uh, and I have one brief comment in the president's report. Then we will have the superintendent's report covering a number of items. Uh, we'll approve the consent vote agenda, which we reviewed earlier this month in committee. Um, and then updates from facilities and finance and per program and personnel. Um, there's no update from property, but we're going to add that to the closed session. That is correct, right? Okay. Um, CEDAW? Yep. Nothing. Okay, IASB, I don't believe there's anything. And then we will have an executive session. There will be actually three items. There are only two listed on the agenda, so we're adding one. Uh, one is collective negotiating matters, 5 ILCS 120-2C2. Um, the second, employment of an employee, one, 5 ILCS 120-2C1. And then we are adding purchase of real property, 5 ILCS 120-2C5. Um, there will be no action other than to return to open session um, that we will take following the executive session. All right? Anything else? Okay. Anybody from the public who would like to speak tonight? Go right ahead. Uh, just, say, just state your name and address for the record, and if you could limit your comments to three minutes or less, we'd appreciate it. Um, I am Jack Deers, I live at 425 Camargo Court in Vernon Hills. I'm Nathan Truger, I live at 214 Norwood Lane, Vernon Hills. Um, so today uh, we are here to talk to you about our civic engagement project for our government class. We are students in Mr. Erickson's government class and we have been challenged with a service project where we were tasked to engage our local government community. Our focus on this project is clean energy and the potential uh, for Lake County to use clean energy such as solar power. So recently Stevenson High School has planned an expans uh, expansion and refurbishment of their campus. If this expansion happens, officials hope to shave one million dollars in the project's cost with a green energy grant from the state. So solar panels, a rooftop greenhouse and classroom, and walls on which plants would grow are among the environmentally friendly elements that could be incorporated into the project and attract that grant money. So this has inspired us to look at green potential in our own school, more specifically with the potential to add solar panels in the upcoming expansion of the Vernon Hills High School campus. It is clear that there is sunlight available in this area with no tree coverage or other obstacles in the way. We have researched just how getting solar panels will work. So although most schools do not have the option of taking advantage of state and federal solar tax incentives as nonprofit entities, they can still benefit from these policies through on-site uh, power purchase agreements. So PPAs are contracts where solar energy companies finance, build, own, and maintain a system on the customer's site and sell the solar electricity generated back to the organization as, at a reduced fixed rate usually at a significant discount compared to what the utility charges for electricity. This rate is offered, uh, offered over an extended period of time, typically 15 to 20 years. Under this model, customers include, incur no or very low upfront costs and saves money in the long term. Under PPAs, the cost saving inherited by the school's <coughs> transi uh, transition to solar power is truly substantial. For example, a company installed 137 kilowatt solar system, uh, solar energy system to the roof of a high school field house and through a PPA agreement and that school is projected to save nearly over $100,000 over the next 15 years. 
So the IESA, or the Illinois Solar Energy Association, maintains a list of the many local companies that offer solar power resources and PPAs. So if anyone believes this would be a good idea, they can use this resource to further research just how solar power could be implemented at Vernon Hills High School. We believe that this could potentially be a very easy and cost-effective way to add some environmentally friendly aspects to Vernon Hills High School and would catapult us in the future of green schools both locally and nationwide. Thank you. Okay, great job. Thank you. So let's move to our educational presentation. Uh, we'll start out with student recognition. All right, fantastic. Welcome, everybody. I'm John Healy. I'm uh, principal of Vernon Hills. And tonight, it's uh, our privilege to congratulate several individuals from both schools. Dr. Clintus and I have the privilege of doing that. Uh, for us, cross country is uh, really the, the gift that keeps giving. They, uh, every year, we seem to wind up right back here as we end the fall and start our winter sports season. Uh, and this year is no different. We uh, had another successful season, both on the boys and girls side. So tonight, it's my privilege to uh, recognize some of those athletes. I wanna welcome up to the mic here, two individuals uh, who are top-notch coaches in the district and represent our school and district in just fantastic ways. We're gonna have Jason Rush come first. Jason's the men's Head varsity uh, cross country coach, come on up, Coach Rush. <laughs> and then when uh, Coach Rush is done, we'll have Suzanne Curry uh, join us up here at the mic to recognize her group as well. Good evening. Thank you, John. Uh, if I can have uh, Senior Jimmy McDonald come on up. Jimmy placed 15th uh, last week in the boys 2A cross country state meet. He ran 15 minutes and 11 seconds over three miles, which is pretty darn fast for a guy that only joined cross country as a junior. Uh, he's a remarkable athlete. Uh, and uh, as a first year coach, I am really lucky to have been able to coach him and experience uh, what a guy like this can put forth for a team. And he was also one of my captains. So it wasn't just about him. He was a great leader all around. And uh, Jimmy, congratulations on doing such a great job. Coach Curry, you're up. Uh, first, I just want to thank the board and the administration for inviting us and recognize the achievements of, of all these kids. Um, congrats to Jimmy McDonald and Coach Rush on their achievement this year. Um, Special Olympics, and we have a great program here, so congratulations on your awards. And soccer has been here a number of times in the last few years, so congratulations to the Rebuild Soccer uh, boys as well. Um, just a couple words, I mean, like uh, Dr. Gilliam said, we've been here the last four years. It's been really nice. Um, this year is a little more, uh, even more special because uh, we broke out of that third place. Um, I don't, don't want to call it a curse, but uh, since it's not a curse, it's a great place to be. But we, uh, we ended up getting second this year, so really um, happy with that. Uh, development and change. Uh, some of these girls have been here for all four years, so it's pretty incredible. Um, they work really hard, so it's it's you know it's not we're not fortunate to be here. They work really hard to do it, so we're fortunate that we are um, allowed to come here and, and be recognized for it. So I'm just going to introduce um, each of the girls as they come up here. All right. Well, first up, I'll get my uh, crutches girl here. Uh, Cassie Bullard is a sophomore. It's her first year on the state team. Um, we have uh, senior Ellie Zazek. She's been on the team for four years as a state member. Next up, 
we have junior Carly Sears. She's been a three-time state team member. I had to take a double take because I have a twin coming up here and making sure I have the right one. Um, a a three-year varsity member, been on the team for three years, but a senior, uh, Leah Wilkowski. Four-year senior, uh, Caitlin Doler. Our next senior is Vivian Chai. Our uh, first freshman here is Riley Mikowski. And our other twin three-year member, Katie Wilkowski. Another sister act here, senior Peyton Mikowski. Uh, we have another freshman, CJ Loik. Um, a three-year junior, Lily Blaze. Two seniors left, uh, we have Hannah Ray is a four-year senior. Another four-year senior is Ryan Schofield. And then I'd also like to introduce my assistant coach, Chris Wolf. Can't do this without him. He's a great Vernon Hills Cross Country on these extraordinary accomplishments. And, um, oh, I should introduce myself. I'm Tom Kalenis, principal of Libertyville High School. And, um, you know, when I was a kid growing up, I had big dreams of winning all kinds of athletic awards. But given my size and my overall lack of athleticism, that didn't happen. But thanks to our varsity boys soccer team, I now have two silver medals that I get to wear with great pride. And so um, we're very proud of our, our boys' soccer team. Um, and I'm going to bring up their extraordinary coach, Mr. Kevin Thunholm, who's going to talk all about these guys. Hello, Kevin. Perfect. All right. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you for everybody's uh, support this year. It was pretty amazing watching uh, the community, both districts coming out um, to support these wonderful men. Um, even the, the, the last game of the year, uh, I believe they announced this as Liberty High School. And um, one of the referees looked over and he goes, look at all the Liberty fans you have. It looks like there's only one Bill, is what he said to me, because we were playing Naperville. And I kind of got goosebumps at that point, um, because I really, truly think this is the team to beat. Um, had an amazing season. Support was uh, unbelievable. So. Um, Thank you, everybody. Um, back to back for a lot of these guys. Um, so I hope we continue to uh, grow as a team um, and get a state championship like our District 128 soccer team did as well. So uh, I'm going to introduce the boys. Um, but thanks again for all the support. Uh, it was a privilege to play in front of all you guys. Um, let's see. We will start with Sawyer. Come on down. Kevin. Jack Brennan. Jacob. Uh, Zach. Jacopo. 
Aquin brother Lorenzo. Matt. short a number of times and this is our first unified state title and it's our first state title in a while so it's nice to have and um, um, again it's a great group of kids that come together and just to recognize you guys great job by the way awesome feet there um, also over here we have a bunch of cross-country runners that were just at our practice helping us out so we follow you guys as much as you guys follow us thank you 
Um, got nothing much to say other than get them up here. So. <laughs> uh, first off, Anthony Bertel, come on. Up. Nathan Ferrara. Libby Karstens. Amy Tumbara. Johnny O'Connor. Shaw Kiernan. Vinnie Roberts. <laughs> Alpina Giza. Kofi <laughs> Runke. <laughs> Chris Morrison. <laughs> Axel Rodriguez. Chase Miller, our unified partners who are amazing this year, helping us out, playing as a team. Oh, we're not, we're not. Lila Pachowski, Brittany, I'm easy. Last but not least, because she has the trophy, <laughs> Alexa Donato. amazing high schools with these phenomenal students that we have and uh, we want to do something before you all go and that is the most important thing that we do is recognizing kids when they grow and they succeed and they achieve so this is the fun stuff okay this is the stuff we love to do here between the district administration and the board um, you know we're very honored and pleased to have you here this evening but we also know that your journey for the students here, your journey here tonight is not just your journey, it's also a journey of your parents and your relatives and your family and your bigger family and your friends. So we want to take a moment tonight to have all the parents, If you're, some of you are standing up already, but if you're standing up already and you're a parent or a family friend uh, or a relative, we want you to raise your hand. If you are sitting and you're one of those, we want you to stand up and we want to give you all a round of applause for supporting these amazing kids. <laughs> we worked, 
God, the word certainly has made a difference with these young people, and, and we're just so proud of them and proud of you for uh, your efforts on their behalf. Now, before we transition to the rest of the board meeting, we always say this. So, if you would like to stay for the rest of the board meeting, we would love to have you stay with yeah. us. Did you hear that, Brian? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but we're also not going to be offended if you exit out one of the doors and you leave. So if you want to do that, this would be the time to do that. So again, congratulations to all of you. to see this project through to where it's gotten today. So I'll have each student uh, who's presenting introduce themselves and then I'll give you an update after they're done speaking as to where the project stands today. <coughs> Thank you. Hi everybody. My name is Julia Sahagian and I'm a senior. Um, I just want to start off by saying thank you to the board for having us. We all really appreciate this opportunity. Okay, so our purpose in this study was to um, was to f figure out the cause for the fish kill that happened at Butler Lake earlier this year. Uh, before our class even heard about the kill, we were already looking forward to studying freshwater ecosystems. So when we heard about the Butler Lake fish kill, we were very enthusiastic about studying it and investigating its causes. Through much research and sampling, we were able to learn a lot about the testing methods used in environmental science, as well as the delicate structure of the freshwater ecosystems. The death of 400 fish within a few days is a staggering number which made the environmental science students even more eager to protect our local ecosystems and animals. The Water Quality Group researched the relationships between levels of certain nutrients and the quality of the water. The Ecosystem Group researched the key components of a freshwater ecosystem and how different species interact with their environment. And um, also, the, we have, each have four groups in all of our classes, and we all work together um, and communicated between classes um, within the groups. Um, and then to carry on, the herbicide group researched how herbicides can affect freshwater ecosystems and its aquatic life 
sampling group tested the water for the nutrient and dissolved oxygen levels, which indicate the water quality and ecosystem health. Um, we use daily logs in order to communicate with the groups between the different classes. This came with some communication struggles, but we found ways to organize our information so it would be easier for other classes to understand our findings. Some of the resources we used included Google Classroom and the Google, Google Drive's Team Drive, which proved to be very useful for large team projects such as this one. go more in depth to each of the groups, uh, the water quality group um, studied um, like the nutrient levels and dissolved oxygen levels of the water. Um, one of the resources that was available to all of the groups was the Butler Lake studies from 2005 and 2015. These studies informed us about past Butler Lake data and how the specific ecosystem works out a whole. From this, we learned that phosphor phosphorus is a limiting factor in freshwater ecosystems, which makes it necessary for plant growth. However, excessive amounts can cause unwanted plant growth and or algae blooms. Aquatic animals need dissolved oxygen in order to survive, which is why low dissolved oxygen levels can cause widespread fish kills, which is also known as hypoxia. Therefore, one of the hypotheses that we came up with from this information was that there is an excessive amount of phosphorus that is being filtered into the Bull Creek watershed and then into Butler Lake. One of the main questions from the ecosystem group was if the species of dead fish were an indicator of the cause of the fish kill. This group researched the Butler Lake food web and how species interact with one another and their environment in order to see if there is an indicator species based on what water conditions it needed to live. This group found that lower dissolved oxygen, also known as hypoxia, can be caused by excess nutrients that cause unwanted plant growth or algae growth, as well as a lack of sunlight, water movement, and plant decay. Hi, um, my name is Amanda Gorley and I'm a junior. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> so um, another one of the groups that um, Julia was mentioning was the herb herb ah, herbicide group. So the driving question in this group is what is the relationship between the herbicide application and the fish kills? Um, so the bacterial decomposition of plants that uses dissolved oxygen, as Julia was talking about earlier as well, and then the fish can die two to five days after a treatment of um, the herbicide, so they, they die um, due to suffocation. And then the application recommendations approximately one-fourth of the BOW at a time, and then allow 10 to 14 days between applications of the herbicide. And then we had many unanswered questions at the beginning, so we didn't know the name of the herbicide that was used or the water treatment system we think was called Conserve. Um, and then the concentration, location, and frequency of the application, we did not know that um, during our investigation either. And then another group that I was mainly part of was the sampling group. Um, the driving question was how do we collect environmental data to investigate the fish kill? So we trained ourselves on the PASCO program, which is just the um, equipment used to do the testing, so then to measure and analyze the in environmental indicators. So we wrote our own instruction manuals for how to use all the tools um, in the program in the field and then back in the classroom. Um, so re we researched procedures for how to take samples for lab analysis and how to conduct exactly what we need when we need it. Um, so then we created a materials list for sampling procedures, which it's kind of small, but right next to it um, is one of our instructions uh, lists. So then I'm here to talk about sampling group. Um, some of the mythology, methodology, excuse me, and the data collection sites. Um, so the, the, we had diverse sampling groups that represented each subgroup 
um, as we were we've been talking about. So we had to sample and test water within one class period. So we spent about 15 minutes actually getting the water and doing the tests necessary outside of class. Um, and then we spent the rest of the remaining class period, which was probably about 25 minutes, um, back in class finishing up all those tests that we needed to conduct. Um, and then the four locations that the, the majority of the groups went to was A, B, C, and D on the map shown. Um, and then one location in the center of the lake where um, extra testing was done to see if there was any difference in the middle of the lake compared to um, around the lake where we had access to. And then the field data collection. So we used all the PASCO probe uh, that I was talking about. So we found the dissolved oxygen probe. We um, looked for temperature of water the light levels in the water, the general conditions of the weather, and then the water sampler itself, which you can't really tell from the photo, but right now there's a string going down into the water with a little glass canister that's going to collect the water, so then we're able to take it in and do testing on it. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Benke, and I'm also a junior. Um, I'm going to talk about the testing that we did um, with the water more in class than in the field. So these, this is a list of the different data that we collected, um, both on site and also in class. A lot of these that we came up with were from the 2015 and 2005 lake study, because um, we wanted to give a, we wanted to have a guide of what we were looking for in the different levels. Um, we also conducted the water tests as quickly as we could, which is why we took half the period to go outside and collect the water and then half the period to do the tests in class. This is all of our data that we collected um, from the different sample sites and then also uh, where they were in relation to the school as well. Uh, the one that we were really trying to look at was both the DO, which is dissolved oxygen in the water, and then we were also looking at nitrates, phosphates, nitrates and phosphates. Those were the three most important. The dissolved oxygen is really important because that's what the fish breathe and how they live. Uh, in Butler Lake, it's averaged between six and 12 is the level that is like livable, I guess you could say, for the fish. And as you can see, all of these are either very close to six or below, which is very difficult for the fish to breathe, which is a very uh, big indicator of what may have caused the kill. Um, and the nitrates and phosphates are extremely low, but that's pretty normal for this time of year because it's after spring, and so all of the fish, or um, all the plants that have grown out have taken in the, the nutrients of phosphates and nitrates, um, which has caused the problem of the overgrowth. Um, but that's why that was very high, um, which wasn't too much of a problem that we were Hello, my name is Matthew Pavlik, and I'm a junior at LHS. Uh, looking forward from here. All right. Uh, an, acronym, an acronym we like to use in our class is See the Issue. Um, and in order to fully address the whole entire problem, we have to see the issue. And S stands for social. So what's the recreational or tourism, and what's, what's the value to people that, um, that the, in this case, the lake has to us? What's the economic cost to repair the lake and the economic cost of the lake itself? And what's the environmental impact, which is the major issue we look at in our class, um, like the impact on the communities of the fish, of the vegetation, and just the underlying communities around it. Um, like for example, we may find raking to be the best uh, solution to the problem um, environmentally, but economically it's very expensive, and that's why herbicides are a popular method used. Uh, what can the village do? Originally, we had Mayor Wepler. We had Mayor Wepler come in, and we gave our presentation. Each class gave a different segment of the presentation to him. Um, and we talked to him and he answered a bunch of the, our un unanswered questions. Um, we still had some other options, um, what the village could do to help solve the issue that we came across. Um, exploring other options are part of herbicide, herbicides like raking or, and not just raking the issue, but also prevention of the problem because the rake has been raked in the past, but uh, obviously the problems occurred due to Butler Lake not being a natural lake because it being man-made, uh, naturally the environment wants to take back the lake and make it into something more like a marsh, which is why there's so much vegetation. Um, we could search for volunteers to help break the lake pads. Also, later in this presentation, we talk about maybe LHS starting a rake the lake club, which was some student ideas we came up with in our class. Um, 
And apart from using just putting the herbicide onto the lake at one application, we came up with using smaller applications or at different times of the year, besides just using it during a time of spring or during in the winter, and so we'd stagger it, maybe combine it with raking so the economic cost is better and we see the issue entirely. What can residents do, local residents around Fuller Lake and just in, the, uh, in Libertyville itself? Um, we wanna make sure homeowners don't dispose of chemicals, branches, or other leaves in the lake and remove fallen trees to make sure the phosphorus and nitrogen levels stay where they should be at a healthy level. Uh, clear yard waste of invasive species, because invasive species cause a majority of the problem because the Butler Lake is being overgrown with a bunch of different plants, which attracts from the factor of how it looks and also the environment itself with all the fish. We want to avoid fertilizing before a rain event, so runoff, all the fertilizer doesn't run off into the lake itself. Um, it does collect both from downspouts and some pumps, are just some of the things we can do. We thought fertilizer was going to be the main issue to the overgrowth, which it possibly could be, but we found that in the past the village put in place uh, issues to stop um, the main culprit was phosphorus um, and fertilizer for the village and the nation as a whole like mandated not to have phosphorus in the in homeowners fertilizer for this reason of eutrophication. And then what can LHS do? Um, our ABC class can monitor conditions, which we have been um, over the past months. And then we could also create, uh, create rake the lake above, which is also a problem we've been discussing. And then here's Mrs. Khan. Uh, as you know, AP Environmental Science is a new class this year for the district, and it's been just such a pleasure and an honor for me to uh, work with these students and lead these kids through this project. Uh, I want to say I had a curriculum completely done and written, um, but when this opportunity came up to you know, take a left turn, uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't say no. The kids were motivated, and they really did do all of the work. We had Prober that we had just taken out of the boxes. It was brand new. Uh, so we didn't know how to use it. So this it really has been a student-driven project, and I couldn't be more proud and more honored to be their teacher, and they continue to make a difference and an impact, which is I wanted to close the presentation by letting you guys know this was not the end of the story. The students also then presented in front of uh, the Parks Committee at uh, the Village of Libertyville, and they actually um, passed a motion in order to create a lake management plan, which is something that was recommended to them as part of the 2015 Butler Lake Report, but they hadn't acted upon. So if the kids wanted to know, did they make a difference? Absolutely. This was then passed down um, to a different part of the village for implementation, and we're looking at ways that we can partner with the village and possibly with other external resources in the community. There are a lot of people who are passionate about Butler Lake and about the watershed in general who want to be involved and who want to work with our students in order to restore the shoreline of Butler Lake and, and look at some long-term projects for removing invasive species. So prepare yourself to hear uh, about what we're going to do next because we're not done. So thank you very much. <laughs> and her students enough. Does anyone have any questions for the students or for Mrs. Khan before we move on to a, a, our next educational presentation? Um, I was wondering who conducted the first two studies, the 2005 and two, uh, 2015? That was the Lake County uh, Health Department. And they're available online, which was a great resource. We have like probably 10 copies of that floating around our classroom. And we found that to be a really great resource to give the kids context and that baseline data for what kind of studies do you look at? What kind of tests do we run? Um, so they are, I know that the Lake County Health Department regularly does test the water, but they don't come up with these comprehensive reports annually. But the data's out there. Question for Amanda. How did you get out to the middle of the lake? <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, <clears throat> I went in a boat. Uh, I was the one at the, who tested, in case anybody didn't know, um, in the center of the lake at Point E, which was on the map here. I can go back to the test. Okay, at Point E in the middle of the lake, um, I went out on a fishing boat with some teachers at LHS, just for safety reasons and everything. Um, and then we took, do you remember that string with the canister that I was telling you about in 
this picture, I took one of those and that um, we took water from the lake and then we tried to get it down deeper to the, um, compare them, but then it was having some problems. So then we only got like surface water, but then we could um, capture the water and then we tested the water that we took inside um, with all the equipment and probeware and stuff. So yeah. And that's awesome. And did that boat belong to the LHS bass fishing team? Yes, it did. <laughs> yep, it was a pretty, pretty great boat. Mm -hmm. yep. <laughs> I, I want to point out, Sorry. for the record, she was signed out of school by her mother and taken on the boat by her mother before it got And I'm sure that the teachers were really happy that you were there to keep them safe. Okay, that, that's the way we would look at that. This is such a great example of learning beyond the four walls of our classroom. And our daring mission inspires us to um, create situations where our students are exploring their passions and discovering their strengths. And I just want to ask the students to what degree your participation in this activity helped you to uncover some passions or interests maybe that you didn't know that you had or some strengths and skills that you discovered through um, engaging in this project. Um, I'm definitely someone in the classroom who kind of like stays in the back and doesn't really participate very often because um, it kind of makes me nervous of like being right or wrong but I think definitely in this class and Mrs. Khan in general I had her for chemistry last year as well um, being in the environment of her like very much being open to saying like any answer is not wrong like we can find a way to make it right or if it's not right particularly I can explain what is right and what's wrong about it also just like being in the environment of having the students really lead helped make everyone more comfortable as well because we we're all on the same level too. It wasn't like Mrs. Khan directing us what to do here and what to do there. It was very student driven and I think that was very eye opening and extremely impactful. Um, in this project I was a part of the ecosystem group and I've always loved to learn more about nature and the environments around us, but it was really cool to, to like research more in depth, um, especially the freshwater systems that are right in our backyard. Um, I am obviously like on my college search, and right now I'm deciding on what to write down on my coll college application, um, what I am planning on studying. And environmental science is definitely one of my top choices. And I think this was um, really eye-opening for me to see what the field work is actually like um, in environmental science. So I'm really grateful that I got that opportunity. Um, so one of my classmates and I, we went out on a Saturday and took pictures um, of all the fish when they were, like when the majority of the fish were floating around. Um, it was really gross and there were a bunch of like fish with maggots in them and everything. Um, but it was really an interesting opportunity because I've never seen anything like that before and then we got to see it first on, or first hand. So I don't think that we would have been able to do that if um, Mrs. Khan didn't let us like take um, control of the project and just do like whatever we thought was right for um, continuing on like in the investigation. So I just thought it would be really great. Back at the beginning of the school year, I went on a walk with my dog around Butler Lake before like we even had the idea of doing this project at the fish kill. And I was like, wow, the lake looks kind of like a little off to me. It doesn't seem right. So I looked online, I saw the Butler Lake 2015 report, and I was like, oh, they did a report on this, and I read it, like read into it. I thought it was pretty interesting, and maybe our environmental science class could do something with it. And then in class, we had an activity where we put on type, like different type, like where we want the class to be, what we want to learn from the class, and like the types of activities we'd like to do. And a really common occurring one was about water and Butler Lake and just using our natural resources and like the place that's right in our own backyard. And then the next day, the Butler Lake fish report happened, and like it was like such a weird coincidence, and just like everything happened. And so it was awesome. We, our whole class like had the idea of getting to do um, the Butler Lake fish kill, like get a research about it and get hands-on experience, like even just as an, a class in a high school, just getting to do all that, like the advanced things that a Butler uh, Lake County report did in 2015. It's that awesome. We got to do it again. It's a lot of fun. 
it was not me, but I could not have planned it better. <laughs> if it was going to happen, the timing worked out great. <laughs> so next year, you know, we'll have to find a different way. <laughs> next year, you can probably go to Lake Charles and Vernon Hills because I think it has interest too. So. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for your inspiring work, and I will give you, uh, you know, we, we saw our tremendous uh, athletic accomplishments prior to this presentation. This is an example of the academic and civic accomplishments of our students. I don't know that a fish kill is cause for celebration, but the <coughs> results of it certainly are. So thank you so much, and this is your opportunity to leave the meeting if you so choose. Um, we have another presentation that will follow you, but thank you so much. presentation is a follow-up to last month's uh, accountability report, um, the report on the Illinois School Report Card, and at that time our results were tentative, and so tonight we'd like to share with you um, to confirm uh, the results which you've seen reported, and then to delve into um, why the results are what they are and how um, our school teams are digging deep into data that really matters about how our students are achieving uh, as individuals and as groups on the measures like the fish kill that and the, the AP science environment the AP environmental science investigation the things that we can't so readily measure with the um, school report card so um, as we uh, hinted at in last month's presentation both Libertyville High School and Vernon Hills High School um, earned exemplary ratings, which means that they are in Tier 1 in the top 10% of schools in the state of Illinois with no underperforming subgroups and um, a graduation rate that far exceeds 67%. So it's official, both schools are exemplary. And remember that those, um, those ratings um, were based on multiple measures, primarily um, academic ratings that included graduation rate and performance on SAT in English language arts and math. Um, chronic absenteeism is another measure that was uh, counted in as well as ninth graders on track this year. In the future additional measures will be included and it's very fortunate that we have our skilled data team of Andrew Young from Vernon Hills High School and Jen Loika from Libertyville High School here tonight to talk not so much about these report card measures, but the ways in which we're using data at each school to measure the, the successes and areas of growth for all of our students. So um, I'm going to step aside and let them take over. Thanks, Dr. Fisher. So uh, one of the th exciting things that you all have tasked us with at each building is combing through uh, lots and lots of data to see you really what we can learn about ourselves and kind of where we are going. And so one of the things that we have added to our tool belts is a product called uh, Tableau. Uh, those of you might be familiar with this, it's, it, it's taken off in the private sector for years and is one of the leading, world's leading uh, data analytic tools and has uh, readily grown in the public and uh, governmental sector. And so we have sort of tapped into this resource and Jen and I were lucky enough to learn quite a bit about the project at a national conference a few weeks ago and have been been exploring in Tableau for the last couple of years. And one of the things that really excites us about Tableau is that anytime we have data requests, whether it's from uh, the district, from the board, from students, from teachers, from our larger uh, leadership teams, uh, the, those pieces of data come from a lot of different places. And we're often swimming in spreadsheets. And one of the great things about Tableau is that it's connected to our server. It's connected to PowerSchool, where we have millions and millions and millions of rows and columns of data that we are, where we are now uniting um, so much of the information that we have about our kids. And so we're excited about this product because we're, gonna, we're going to be able, really for the first time, to have accessible data and be able to rather quickly um, automate some of the some of the tasks that we want to start looking at uh, as a district. So. Yeah, so we have a nice little flow chart over there, and it pretty much highlights 
the power of Tableau. Before, people would come to us with a data request and it would be, yeah, let me get back to you on that question. I'm gonna take a week or two and we're gonna play with all of our spreadsheets that Andy mentioned. And then, you know, you've kind of forgotten about the question that you asked, but here you go, here are your results and let's all talk about it and share it. And instead, with Tableau, it's, it's right in the moment. When someone comes in and they say, I'm really curious about how our team top versus our co-top versus our regular classes are doing. Well, let me log into a dashboard, pull that up for you, and immediately look at the results and start talking about action as opposed to getting stuck in that time lapse that is the spreadsheets that we once had. It's kind of like um, Maslow's hierarchy of data needs. You really can't get to the top if you're stuck at the bottom all the time. So now we can start to really align to our mission and focus on the questions that we want to focus on instead of just getting stuck in the spreadsheet. Okay, so we have a couple examples for you of the power of Tableau. The first one is highlighting old way versus new way with our progress report data. So we would have a progress period end, we would run a report, it would be a bunch of PDFs involving all these different grades and how many students got this grade and this grade and this class. And it was on paper or, you know, electronic paper, and it didn't really go very far. So now with Tableau, we can show you an example of it to the next level. Here we are, department of course grade tables. You can see each department and the breakdown of letter grade for each department. You can quickly drill in to see that same breakdown for each course. Drill in further to see it for each teacher of that course, and even further for each class period of each teacher for that course. You can hover over different cells for more specific information, like the percent of the students in that row with that letter grade. You can click on any cell to filter the student names list and hover over the boxes for more specific student information. You can also use any of the filters available up here to refine your data. For example, if you only want to look at our ninth grade students in the courses and grades, you can apply that filter and your table will recalibrate just showing you freshman students. The same information that applies. That's our department of course grade tables. So uh, one of the things, you know, Jen and I are often working with our leadership teams, specifically John and Tom, kind of talking about larger things that we're looking at. But what often happens is we have a lot of ad hoc projects where people just kind of want to know what's going on specific to maybe their department. And so this is just going to be another example of where, so PowerSchool has over 900 tables that hold data in our SIS system. Uh, unfortunately, those tables often don't talk to each other very well as you can possibly manage. And so this software allows us to join those uh, tables and that information uh, rather quickly. Uh, and so here's just an example of a quick ad hoc project that one of our supervisors recently asked for. We can simply build a dashboard that's connected to all of that data in PowerSchool uh, and get this information to supervisors really quickly. So for example, uh, my CTE supervisor uh, recently wanted to know uh, what enrollment looked like uh, in her department in the various areas and specifically uh, whether or not students were earning a CTE designation designations and what that meant. So CTE designations means that a student leaves Vernon Hills High School with two or more CTE related classes. So if you look for the graduation, graduating class of 2018, for example, um, the orange classes are students who took consumer, uh, are family consumer science courses. The blue would be applied tech courses. And then of course the, the gray highlights our business courses. And the total number of students from that graduating class that took a class in that area and specifically in that course. And then the nice thing is that now uh, our supervisor can quickly see whether or not students earned that CTE designation and then in fact the actual number of courses that student took in that department during their four years at Vernon Hills High School. And they can up here then quickly change the graduation year if they want to go back and look at trends. The other thing that's nice, for example, there's multiple dashboards here, but one of the other uh, areas that CTE is looking into is what are, what are our different breakdowns in ethnicity and gender relative to specific courses and do we have any um, areas of improvement or any equity issues or areas that we can encourage various different groups uh, to take some of these uh, very hands-on um, courses 
Uh, so for example, if we wanted to see uh, what classes our females are enrolling in, uh, in the 2018-2019 school year, we can very quickly see that in certain classes they're, you know, underrepresented, in certain classes they're overrepresented. Same thing on the ethnicity side, if we wanted to maybe look at um, different courses are Hispanic students, which make up roughly 14% of our, our demographic here at Vernon Hills High School. What courses they're taking in, and whether or not they're underrepresented or overrepresented, we can very quickly um, do that, and then even drill down uh, by student. So this is just one example of the ability to get really important data into the hands of our supervisors uh, as quickly uh, as possible. Thank you. All right, thanks for watching the videos. We were a little nervous about the Wi-Fi. So um, as we kind of wrap up, what, obviously one of the areas that this allows us to think about is you know, whole school-wide data, district data versus the individual student data. And we could take that into a variety of different categories. But when we think of school-wide, how are we doing amongst the buildings, uh, thinking about different departments? Uh, how are we monitoring certain aspects, whether it's test scores, whether it's programmatic things like athletics and participation and attendance, and bigger issues uh, as a school? Um, versus kind of the individual uh, student data. We really have multiple multiple options. Do you want to talk about the individual student sure. data and launch it? Yeah, so one thing that we're building that we think is gonna harness a lot of power is a student risk identification dashboard. So for example, we can filter in a bunch of different ways. Show me all the students who have this many absences. Show me the, how many students have this many Ds or Fs. Show me the students whose grade has dropped 15% or more over the last X many weeks. So that way, we have less students possibly falling through the cracks and not getting noticed. And when we pull them up to the top and we can identify them right away, we can intervene before things get to be a little bit too challenging for them. So that's some of the ways that we're harnessing this tool for specific individual student needs. A couple of examples, uh, you saw this earlier, this is more from a school-wide and departmental example though. Uh, math classes along the left-hand side um, on, and their representation of ethnicities by current enrollment. And then to the right, uh, the bar chart on the right simply looks at the ethnic breakdown uh, by Ds and Fs. So do we have an over or under representation uh, of Ds and Fs by a certain racial and ethnic groups in the school? Uh, so right there again, connecting to our mission of daring and specifically um, some of the uh, issues of equity that might relate to global or, or to aware, um, and really able to start to talk about things that maybe we've never been able to talk to as a building um, around areas of growth. Another example um, would be just looking at our TARDI analysis. So we've made some pretty large um, programmatic uh, and structures to our day uh, in the district, and so let's start talking about what our attendance looks like and are, are there trends? What about trends with attendance? What about by period, by day of the week, etc.? So really, the questions that we have uh, are probably unlimited as our ability to now collect and kind of look at uh, the different data streams that are, uh, that are coming in. Jen's gonna wrap up. Yeah, so pretty much as we said before, this allows us to take a lot of that manual work and put it aside and really focus on the questions that we want to ask to improve the educational experience for our students, to, to really make sure that the decisions that we're making are backed by the numbers, by what's going on, and that you know, we're doing the stuff that really matters as opposed to taking time and running reports that we just do every single period because we've done it in the past. That's it. Thank you, guys. So that's, re that's really awesome. Let me, let me put you guys on the spot and ask just a couple of questions. Please do. So if you had a 10-point scale and on the left-hand side, you know, you know, I have a team tool and I'm just playing around with it, trying to figure out what it does. And on the, that's all that's all about zero or one. And on, and on the 10, it's like, no, this is really how I drive my business. I use it all the time. <clears throat> Where are we? Uh, and don't say five if you could. Um, <laughs> excuse me. And, and then really the follow-up question is a more important one. What do we need to do to take it to the next level? Because I, I, I gotta believe it's still early. But this is this is really impressive stuff. Well, that, that number changes by the hour, actually. Um, I, if I I'm gonna say it is a two or a three fair. I would say yeah. Two. Yeah, I would say I think a two or a three is probably fair. So a couple of years ago, we had a desktop version where we were just playing playing on it, um, helping our supervisors make cor course recommendations for our upperclassmen and for eighth graders that were coming into the district to now actually having on the server where we have live dashboards where we have logins for our stakeholders who can log in and actually see that. So um, we've got about five or six that we're playing with right now um, with a goal of kind of building larger ones monthly and then 
making some of these ad hoc projects that we used to do in Excel or Access or other data tools, moving those onto those uh, onto the server. So, do you want to keep going? Yeah, I, I, I agree with Andy. I would say definitely too. The biggest hurdle, and we have passed it now, was connecting that data and making it live. Really understanding our data warehouse and how we're reaching into that and pulling that data out and manipulating it. So we have left over that hurdle, which I think was really the biggest one. Like Andy said, we're publishing information now. We are slowly going to roll this out over the next two months to our administrative stakeholders. They're going to get their accounts. We're going to teach them exactly how to manipulate the data and consume it based on what we've built. And then we're going to start listening to their questions and what they want to investigate. And I think that's going to, that's going to take it up really quickly. Yeah, no, it's real. And then are you guys plugged into user groups or, or you know, how do you benchmark what we do versus what somebody that may have more experience is doing? Yeah, I, Tableau is a lot more in the business world than in the education world. Higher education has been picking it up. I would say that where we're at right now, there's not as many schools. It's starting. It's really starting to grow. Um, we have little buttons at the conference we just went to, and one of them was EDU, and there were some of us wearing them. Um, but it was not the majority, majority by any means. Uh, there are some local groups of local schools who are getting together and discussing what they're doing, and uh, Andy can speak more to some of the people we met with him, but we have some colleagues and some spouses of colleagues from other school districts who've been showing us what they're doing and we've been learning from them pretty quickly. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, it, it's a great tool. We've used it at Baxter now for about a year or several, two years. Um, I, I think maybe to take something out of the, uh, the AP environmental uh, science group, because you can just go ahead and dig in all different kinds of things, but maybe putting the question up front, what are you trying to solve for? Or what are the key metrics? Or what are, what are the objectives that you want to monitor for? And re, you know, basically creating report cards that allow you to see that. Because it gets really easy to try, you know, we're, we try to boil the ocean. And there's so much data and everything else. It's really getting into prioritization. What, what's important to look at? And then starting with that, and that kind of gets you to go from two to ten. So it's great stuff. It's a great tool. The other thing is, I think too quickly we try to get into and you know, we get into the performance aspect of it. You know, or are we are we hitting our goal? <clears throat> goal from a performance standpoint. And I guess what I would really encourage you guys to do. To me, this is a great diagnostic tool from which we're going to continue to learn. Okay. And I guess I don't need to teach you guys about learning at your business. Um, but that's really what I think we want to do here. We want to learn, you know, where are our weak spots? What can we do to improve? And all, just like you're doing. I, I just think it's phenomenal. This is one of the better things that I've seen amongst many good things. Is the, and I would just say as a principal, you know, we are at the tip of the iceberg and what's uh, promising and exciting for John and I is every week on Wednesdays we have our teachers and uh, professional staff and teams of professional learning communities. And to your point, there, the goal of those is for teachers to learn from one another. And what has historically been difficult in a PLC model is that um, there's a lot of hard work that goes into trying to find data that you can use yeah. to make real-time kind of decisions about your instructional practices. Usually teachers have to wait until semester to get a significant amount of data where they can look back and say, did what we do worked and what Tableau is going to allow us to do is to be able to provide teacher teams um, m more dynamic and real-time data about how their instruction is impacting student learning and teachers will not have to spend time being the producers of the data they'll be able to just as Jen mentioned be the consumers of the data and so those two things um, freeing up teachers time to just consume it and giving them the data in real time uh, are going to have, I think, profound impacts on a teacher's ability to make some of those uh, learnings about their class and about how their instruction is playing out for their students. Yeah, and I, and I honestly hope we can do that in a way, you know, in a culture where people aren't afraid to measure, because, I mean, that's what happens, all, you know, in our business, I don't know what yours got, but everybody's always afraid to measure because they're afraid they're going to get evaluated, blah, 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 and it's hard. Um, but the more I think we can measure the right things and learn from them, from that we get better. I mean, that would just be awesome. I, I really do want to commend uh, Jen and Andy too for um, understanding the power of this tool and taking a very deliberate approach to how we've um, uh, 
studied it and enlarged our use of it over time, and, and they've really made the case for how we need to expand the use of this tool through their um, inquiry around it and their connections with colleagues in other districts as well. So um, we, we are here today largely through their efforts. Well, again, when you look at data-driven or data-informed school improvement, part of the reason that we've had the dramatic growth that we've had over the last 10 and 12 years is because we've used data at some level for us to continue to be able to target all of our students okay, and uh, be able to plan for their future success. We have to be able to have analysis of at a deeper level of how our kids are doing. So what this does, Scott, to your point, is it really informs the whole data-driven school improvement process um, at both of the buildings and gives us the tools to be able to ask the right questions okay, and have some answers and then develop uh, strategies and activities uh, to address those questions. So it's the next generation, I look at it as it's the next generation in data-driven or data-informed um, school improvement planning. When did the district begin using this tool? We, um we started with the first desktop, was it my first year? My first year, so the fall of 2015 um, was the first time we bought the license. And I think just two or three of us had it, and again, we use it mostly for course placement for our incoming eighth graders, uh, basically to build scatter plots and look at a variety of different measures, um, teacher recs and you know different map scores and PSAT scores and a bunch of different things, and then look at historical trends and try to make some really strong recommendations for kids. And then it's slowly, uh, slowly grown from there. In addition to making strong recommendations for students, Andy and, his, and the teams were really concerned about identifying students who uh, perhaps through mm -hmm. these different data points were not being placed appropriately, perhaps not being given the appropriate challenge or appropriate support. So it, it really began with a focus on individual students as well and serving their needs. And while well, we've had the desktop for a couple of years now, we are just now getting the server, which is really what takes us to the next level because the server allows us to share accounts with all of our stakeholders so that they can access it. Before, it just lived on our computers. So we could take our show on the road, and it was great while we were there, but now that, that people can actually engage whenever they need to, get in, dive into the reports, do it, whatever it is that's going on, that's really where the power is. No, that's great. And I, you know, I love that every once in a while in PNP or someplace, you know, bring back some examples of what you're doing. I mean, yeah, I kind of think of it in terms of what, so what, now what. So this is all what, the data. You know, so what, does it matter? And most importantly, now what? Okay, but it'd be great if you came back once in a while, you know, almost like we get a list of field trips all the time. We get a list of, hey, here's some other, here's some things we found and some stuff we're trying to do. It'd be, it'd be awesome to just see it. And, and, and again, that's living the daring mission, you know, and, and Living the tools that, that we have, I think that would be fantastic. Yeah, nice job. Yeah. Thank you. All right, that was a full um, hour plus. Huh? Okay, student school board representatives. Um, as college deadlines grow ever closer, we want to extend a big thank you to English teachers Tony Isabelli, Samantha Phillips, Mandy Patrick, and Rachel Campbell for volunteering their time to help seniors with their college essays at the first college essay night, which was planned and hosted by Becky Bolito. Uh, the event was a success, and we're sure the seniors are very grateful for the help they've received throughout this college process. Um, as the school continues to utilize our new peer tutoring program, we want to extend big thanks to students Chase Johnson, Cooper Gilliam, Jenna Helmick, and Emma Silbar, who have committed to tutoring weekly as Renta tutors in Mr. Isabelli's, Mr. Lukens, Ms. Bastiani's, and Mrs. Macias's classes, respectively. And we also want to thank staff Allison, Sierra, Wendy Meister, and Megan Geltner, who have also utilized Renta tutors. The Latino Alliance Club and International Club joined forces to hold a fundraiser earlier this month, raising money to help keep at-risk children in school. And it's fantastic to see groups of VHHS students working together to make such a positive difference in their community. As part of Red Ribbon, Red Ribbon Week, on October 25th, the, wellness, the Prevention and Wellness Program's Healthy Fair was held during lunch periods in the foyer. There were over 600 students in attendance. 
There was a variety of activities available and booths were hosted by numerous community organizations including Orange Theory Fitness, Young Living Essential Oils, Amita Health System, and Athletico. Taffy apples were provided by Cougar Parent Connection and were given to students who visited six or more booths at the fair and over 400 taffy apples were handed out. Mrs. Dill and our school student assistance program coordinator called the event a huge success. She said the fair was interactive and exciting. You could really feel the energy from the students who attended. It's an event that she truly looks forward to each year and felt like this was one of the best years yet. We're happy to see so many students engaged in events like these. We would like to wish Madeline Powell congratulations as she was recently named president of the Illinois Deans Association at their fall conference. Senior Jillian Bowes, who is a member of the National Association for Music Education All National Choir, was recently selected to the High School Honors Performance Series Ensemble. This means she will get the opportunity to study and perform at the Sydney Opera House and get to know other accomplished musicians like herself. On November 1st, the cast of Hello Dolly put on their annual senior citizen showing of the musical. 400 senior residents from Brookdale attended the dinner and show. This was one of five incredible performances the musical cast put on. Special congrats to Kevin Phelan, Jen Phelan, Jeremy Little, Dana Green, Stephanie Ashmore, Sarah Gunther, and the entire cast of Hello Dolly. The show closed two weekends ago to large audiences and rave reviews. The talent of our students and staff continues to amaze. Upcoming on Sunday, December 2nd, is the annual Magical Dessert Concert presented by the choir. Delicious desserts will be served and the choir will entertain with a variety of Renaissance era songs and holiday carols. There are a limited number of tickets still on sale, so we encourage you all to attend. The annual variety show for Vernon Hills High School is on this coming Friday, November 16th. This year's theme is daring and has become an open opportunity for all VHHS students to showcase their unique talents in front of their peers and families. With 15 expected performances, it will be a chance to see how, how well we will reflect in the district initiative and we are excited to see what creative acts our students are going to bring on stage this year. Congratulations to Girls Women Dive. They've just won their first CSL conference title and this past Saturday they also won their IHSA sectional, qualifying for state in three relays and eight individual events while also breaking seven school records in the process. We wish them the best of luck down at state. Also, congratulations to singles player Claudia Bilkey and doubles team of Sharia Agula and Sasha Yuskiv for advancing to the IHS State State Tennis Finals. They played on the weekend of October 18th at Prospect High School. Senior student athlete and Vernon Hills football player Derek Gerald was awarded the accolade High School, High School Athlete of the Month by the Chicago Tribune Suburban Sports. He was also awarded a $500 award donated by uh, country financial with respect to his achievements on the field. Congratulations, Derek. VHH, VHHS recently hosted a coach's timeout to talk about injury prevention and high school athletics. Questions were answered that evening over how our students may find the appropriate proactive measures to take to stay healthy. Physical welfare supervisor and soccer coach Mr. McCallew iterates that his students and his players should take strength courses at school because all research points to a good strength program as the number one way to prevent injuries. VHHS students are also pushing out this message. In the new AP research, co research course, senior Alex Ludov, who had recently faced an ACL injury this past spring, has also been investing time into researching about this very cause and hopes to push out this message too. Uh, students in Mr. Proceed's human phys uh, classes spent an hour to watch Live from the Heart, where the class reviewed footage for a coronary bypass. Um, asking around about the experience, a lot of Students have emphasized that it was difficult to stomach, but also highlighted that it was an eye-opening experience for them. They also ran a live video chat with the hospital and were allowed to ask doctors questions about how it's all run inside the operating room. And some updates on some recent field trips. Um, the journalism cl class went to Chicago to attend a journal journalism convention at the Hyatt Regency. Uh, VHHS senior Anna Amiakowska gave an, a great explanation of what the, experiment, uh, the experience meant for her. Um, she gained new perspectives on other media forums and also learn valuable tips for the field of work. With what she learned, she's interested in looking to start a radio station for the school, but outside of that, she got closer with the people in her class and gained new friends interested in the field of journal journalism like herself. For two days, Outdoor Ed took a field trip to, up to Devil's Lake. They spent the days outdoors hiking trails, building campfires and cooking food, and also taking a ferry ride across Devil's Lake. Um, a senior expressed that it was an unforgettable experience and that, it was a, and that she made lots of friends while she was there. Um, Symphony Orchestra had the opportunity to take a field trip to DePaul University. They were all part of an 11-day music festival to celebrate the DePaul 
School of Music's um, new Holt, Holt Schneider Performance Center and met internationally acclaimed performers. Uh, moreover, our students were not only, not only given access to this new state of art building, but also rehearsed and performed for the DePaul Music Education Sympho Symposium in one of its brand new rehearsal spaces and worked with uh, Dr. Cliff Colnott, a world-renowned conductor. Orchestra director Mr. Green highlights that Dr. Conan led the students through a transitive rehearsal experience during which they attained high levels of technical refinement through disciplined focus and advanced rehearsal techniques, and the orchestra as a result improved dramatically. A couple of weeks ago, BHHS students went around our classrooms to talk about how they've been giving back to the community. Um, seniors Jack McCrone, Katie Brennan, Sneha Akarati, Kayla Cottle, and junior Ruslan Kondulav um, gave talks about their personal community projects and how they've dedicated something, uh, dedicate something to a cause. Um, the hope is that our student leaders can create a platform for others, others in the future and reciprocate the need of encouraging their peers to find ways to give back to the community. Um, Dr. G has been working with groups of staff and students to design the potential new classrooms, gymnasium, and cafeteria. And one of the goals of this new cafeteria design is to become healthier. Last week, a group of staff and students visited Trimark Corporation for a demonstration of an oven that will make the school's deep fryer obsolete. The group was excited to report that the fried foods uh, like french fries, chicken patties, cheese sticks, and tater tots can be cooked without a fryer. And in the even better news, the oven baked food tasted even better than the fried. For LHS, oh sorry, um, the boys soccer team ended their season last Saturday. The Cats finished as the second place team in the state for the second year in a row. They broke numerous records during their undefeated run and are happy with their season. The girls swimming team had an amazing performance at the sectional competition. The girls placed second overall, and several of the team members qualified for state. Emma Gleason, Alex Eastman, Anna Hurd, and Paige Rankin. Emma Gleason won the sectional titles and had state qualifying times in the 100-meter butterfly, the 200-meter freestyle, and the 200-meter medley relay. Alex Easton received first place and qualified in the 100-meter backstroke and got second place in the 100-meter free. The boys' cross-country season came to a close following the state races. Will Gordon qualified for state, finishing 78th overall and motivated to keep working hard to improve for next year. The team won the regional championship and performed well in the sectionals as well. Twelve students from LA Tech participated in the Illinois State Senator McConchie Youth Advisory Council on October 30th. They met with approximately 30, stu 30 other students from schools in the districts at the Barrington Public Library, where they listened to public office holders' presentations and developed their own mock bill to address an issue they view as being important. A few participants sent out, sent out a school-wide survey to gather information on what issues LHS students care about in the country and were able to, re to present some of this data during, di during discussions at the meeting. A common takeaway was that the participating students felt there was a unique chance to interact with many different points of view on significant topics, and they are grateful that the CRC presented this opportunity. The debate team had a fantastic performance at the November 3rd debate tournament at Friend High School. In the Lincoln-Douglas style debate, Louisville High School junior Drew Hopkins was the only undefeated debater and took first place overall and third place speaker. Paulina Cleodrova took fifth place overall and fourth place speaker. The congressional debate team had a tournament this weekend. Andrew Klein won the award of best presiding officer in this chamber. Congrats to all those who have been working hard in the tournaments. All right, so last Friday, several students were honored at a breakfast to recognize their national merit achievements. Brian Hong, Ian Smith, Alice Lilydahl, Annika Pajorklin, George Hayek, and Mitch Gifford were honored as National Merit semifinalists. Evan Chia, Lisa Zhao, Tobias Cruz, Annalisa Waddick, Jake Duffy, Luke Borelli, Jacob Cam Kevin Kaya, and Max Sowers were honored as National Merit Commended Scholars. So the fall musical Pippin put on three nights of an incredible production between October 25th and October 27th. The show dazzled the audience with splendors of color and stunning costumes, silk acrobatics, and massive set design. Parts of the show engaged the audience by singing a plethora of choruses and songs. Many people were taken aback by how professional the costume changes, magic tricks, and the overall performance was throughout the show. So for school ongoings on Halloween, student and staff dressed up in costumes to get in the Halloween spirit. A number of costume traditions continued this year, and students competed in the staff costume competition. The Wildcat Warehouse has officially opened for business. The Entrepreneurship Class and Vocational Education Program have been organizing and managing the store, which gives them first-hand experience in the small business leadership role. The warehouse sells everyday items that students may need, such as gum, coffee, and Chromebook chargers. It was an instant hit. The canned food drive was another success for the Liverpool High School Student Council. 
Classes were collecting cans for two weeks with prizes for the classes collecting the most goods. The prizes ranged from wish gift cards to a chance to shake up the wake up. After two weeks of collecting, the cans were taken to Libertyville Township's food pantry. Um, wish season has officially begun at LHS with classes already beginning to fundraise. Wish stands for Wildcat Initiative for Sharing Helping, and it consists of LHS classes fundraising to buy gifts for underprivileged families. The fundraising culminates in the end of the season dinner, which, in which the families get their gifts. We're excited to fundraise and help out. And LHS was awarded the Blue Ribbon of Excellence this year. A number of banners can be seen around the school, which have been brought, to honor, brought this honor to the attention of all of our students. To celebrate the achievement, the cafeteria was set up with hot chocolate and cookies for students to snack on before class this Friday morning. The festivities made for a wonderful, for a wonderful and cheerful ending to the week. And uh, I would just also say that the uh, Libertyville students who are here for your government project, I will vouch for you that this was a, a long meeting, so if you need to leave now, and I will tell your teacher you stayed till 9 o'clock, you have my permission to go. <laughs> Yep, I'll sign for it. <laughs> 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 you trust them. All right, so let's say we have time on it. No, we have time on it. Can you guys get a question um, with some frequency I wanted to make it clear to people exactly what's involved in that evaluation so there are actually six different criteria um, that Dr. Lee's evaluated on first being board and super uh, the board and superintendent relationships um, second being personnel super, super uh, personnel um, and supervision evaluation um, the third, fiscal accountability and budget preparation. Uh, four, student relations. Fifth, planning and goals. And then the last one, public relations and communications. And so it's a relatively detailed process. We get feedback from all the board members. Um, and, and I can communicate that we were unanimously in agreement that um, Dr. Lee has met all of the um, expectations in each of those categories. Uh, and in fact, I'll, I'll read a summary statement. Uh, I'm not required to read this, but I thought I would. I'd share it with the public. Um, overall, as a board and as a community, we're fortunate to have uh, Dr. Lee as our superintendent. His willingness to partner with the board, staff, teachers, students, and the community, his outstanding leadership, his ability to recruit and develop and retain outstanding talent, and his unending commitment to excellence and continuous improvement are all foundational to the success of D128. He continues to lead an outstanding team, which continues to build and improve upon the outstanding legacy that's the hallmark of D128. Keep up the great job, and thanks for all of your hard work and outstanding effort. So I know, um, I think on behalf of the board, um, we are very fortunate um, to work with Dr. Lee and his outstanding team, okay? This is a team sport, it's very clear. And, and I think really on, on nights like tonight where we see all the recognition of the, the great athletic work that we're doing, um, some of the great academic work that we're doing, and then some of the things we're doing to push the envelope even further. Um, I think it's just an outstanding um, example of the great work that you guys do. So thank you to uh, everybody for their hard work. Thank you for the opportunity to continue to serve the district. And uh, I would say that um, we have a good back and forth with the board uh, during the course of the year in, in uh, evaluation processes and summary of that. Um, and we talk about things that we're doing very well in, in the areas that we can continue to grow in. And uh, I can, uh, as I can do as a leader as well, and uh, that feedback is appreciated because it, continual improvement is what we're all about. So 
It's a phenomenal district, uh, great board, you know, great uh, administrative team and a, and a great teaching and support staff. And uh, we're gonna keep doing good work and we're gonna, as you saw tonight, we're, we're doing all of the work to ensure that our kids grow and achieve um, at higher levels. And that's our bottom line. That's our, our business line here, if you will. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to serve the district again and uh, to the administrative team. So I appreciate work, the opportunity to work with the board uh, in this district. Okay, and with that, you're Thanks, up. Pat. Super it's me now. Um, okay, so um, the board may not even know this, but to recognize the outstanding efforts of nearly 6,000 elected school board members throughout the state, November 15th of each year is designated as School Board Members Day in Illinois. This is an opportunity to build community awareness and understanding about the essential role locally elected Board of Education members assume in a representative democracy. This year's School Board Members Day theme is Sharing the Vision. This day of observance offers an opportunity for us to recognize the leadership provided by our local boards of education and help build a stronger relationship between school board members, the community, faculty, and parents. We are fortunate to have a board meeting tonight in which we can publicly thank all of our District 128 board members for their dedication to students and staff of D128 and to residents of our communities. On a personal note as the superintendent, I can absolutely tell the community that we would not have been able to accomplish all that we have accomplished at D128, LHS, and DHHS over the past decade plus without a world-class school board and world-class school board members. So thank you for all that you do and please accept these certificates as a token of our appreciation. So Brian's going to give each one of you a certificate. And then I would like to maybe get us together in the corner here. I'll trade you a quick picture. I'll trade you. I will throw that Thank you. Come on. It's coming around. Very nice. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so why don't we just come to the corner here and that way you all don't have to walk. We're going to take a little picture. Did you get that? Whether you want to or not, we're taking a picture. So, yeah, watch that. Watch that right there. So, yeah. all right, can we just, Mary, can we do the L and maybe take it from there? Oops, I don't know. We can be close. You know what? You guys take the picture. No, 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 Okay, great, congratulations, thank you for everything. And as Pat said last month, I knew the only way that I could do that tonight is if I didn't tell you because you're all pretty humble and you would go, no, don't do that, it's not about us. So um, we wanted to make sure that we get that done. Okay, a uh, little bit more good news. The students covered lots of ground tonight. Um, and I just wanna say this one more time again uh, for uh, our audience at home. Representatives from District 128 were proud to accept Libertyville High School's Blue Ribbon School Award on behalf of LHS students, staff, and community at last Thursday's Blue Ribbon Ceremony in Washington, D.C. Accepting the award from Abba Kui, Director of the National Blue Ribbon Program for the United States Department of Education, were District 128 Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum and Instruction, Rita Fisher, LHS Principal Tom Colentis, Superintendent Prentice and uh, Director of Communications, um, Mary Todrick. And I do want to note for the record that uh, LHS is now an official uh, 2018 winner, and within the same decade, uh, Vernon Hills High School also won the award back in 2010. So we're very proud of Libertyville High School um, and uh, their work and the continued excellence at both of our great high schools. Tom's passing the flag around now, but he said you do have to give it back, okay, so um, at some point. So Tom, congratulations, and uh, just as it was seven or eight years ago, going out with Ellen Swick and, and John and Cheryl Steffens to Washington, D.C. to be part of that, uh, it was a very, very special experience to be with you. 
um, and Rita and Mary to uh, accept the word in Washington. So congr congratulations to you, the LHS um, family. Uh, we're very proud of all of you. Great job. Yeah, <laughs> Okay, uh, LHS True Wildcat students were recognized and nominated for the True Wildcat Award for the ways in which they embody the daring mission and live the life of a wildcat. In November, honorees are Megan Bowling, Calvin Blom, Nicholas um, Simaris, Ryan Gadek, uh, John Power, Angel Campos, Chandra Dulal, Natalie Smith, Michelle Hogarty, Sarah D'Onofrio, and Michelle Gembra. Uh, the LHS bands have been awarded the programs of excellence by the National Band Association. The NBA Programs of Excellence Initiative recognizes quality programs at all levels. Programs and educators which challenge students and promote standards of excellence will be honored nationally through this initiative. And the LHS student artists were part of the 16th annual Chicagoland 4x5 High School Art Exhibition. 45 area high schools with close to a total of 1,300 pieces of artwork, all only four inches by four, uh, five inches large, were entered in the show. Libertyville's Outstanding Student Artist won several awards at the show. Emma Lash received a first place in printmaking. Other awards included for digital photography, honorable mentions, Emily Detlaff and Cindy uh, Cooper. Analog photography, honorable mention was Margot Scally and printmaking honorable mention Bridget Wilson, Jack Nicholson, Kelsey Collins, and Lindsay Archibald. So congratulations to all of our students. Okay, um, as Rita mentioned earlier, and we did talk about last week, uh, the board has um, hard copies of the 2018 uh, Illinois School Report Card. Those are posted and available um, on website link uh, now. And um, just to reemphasize the point, both of our high schools were in the top. 10% exemplary uh, rankings, which is not um, easy to do given the criteria for that. So again, we're proud of uh, both of our high schools uh, for the work they continue to do with our young people. Okay, next on the superintendent's report, and uh, we do this at- Superintendent Sultai, I just oh, have a question on the report yeah. card. Sure. Yeah, just, uh, and maybe Dan might answer it, or maybe you. I was looking at uh, just the, the report, and one of the things I noticed, the average teacher salary was 100, about 109,000 compared to the state average of 66. But then it had a bunch of little asterisks on the side. So just a couple questions. What is that per se, the 109? And what was it like last year? Did it trend up, did it trend down? I mean, how does that seem to be trending? It's a great question. Dan, do you want to jump into that? Uh, short answer is I don't exactly know. Um, I don't I don't see the asterisks, but maybe I'm on a different. No, page. it just it says salaries and counts of staff are summed across. It kind of gives this little like paragraph on the right side. Which page are you on? I'm on page three, three of thirteen. 13. So I got the standard growth base the percentage of time. So uh, my guess is that there would, where they would pull this data from is from EIS, and so depending on how they pull that data from EIS, will give the staff that they're showing meaning. So if you're Maybe they're pulling just teacher. I'd have to look into more of the data that they're pulling to do that because if you you could be pulling kind of a sub, not a subsection, but <laughs> not all of our teachers because we know the average teacher salary for that year because that I'm, I'm guessing that's fiscal year 2016 or 17 would be my guess. It's always a few years behind in, in the fiscal year data. Um, so I'd, I'd have to kind of look in to see what that is. And in terms of trending data, I, I wouldn't know. I, but I, that's something that I can look into and even for future stuff. Yeah, again, just I'd be interested to know what the trend is on that and again also the trend at the state level because it's just 109 and 66. It's just, again, I'd like to see mm -hmm. the trend. Yeah. So I can suggest that there's actually two versions of this report card. There's an in interactive report card online if you just Google Illinois uh, School Report Cards, look up uh, District 128. It not only gives you that information, but it also drills down and, and lets you look at trends, awesome. lets you do comparisons to other districts. So but it gives you a lot more uh, yeah. information than what's just on this, you know, list of numbers. Thank you. That's a really good question, but we'll report back on that. I mean, I know you'll you can go back and take a look, but we'll also report out on that. Um, and the other thing we can do is actually go back and look at the 2017 report card. Right. and click on that and at least give us a year but we're more interested in the trend data for a number of <coughs> so, thank you good question 
So when, Thanks. You, uh, right, when you look at that trend date on the interactive report card in 2017, the district average salary was 102338, and in 2018 it's 109495. So it's on the, as, uh, as Jim said, the um, Illinois Interactive School Report Card, and they do provide that trend data. So those are the two figures for 17 and 18. Great, thank you, excellent. Okay, but just, just to make that point again for the community that's, that's watching at home, so um, it's Illinois Interactive Report Card, so if you just Google IIRC, you'll be able to put in District 128, um, or really either of the high schools, because that's our district profile, you'd be able to see that uh, number for uh, yourself. Okay, great question. Okay, we'll come back with an answer to that. Yeah, that'd be great. Thanks so, so much. That'll, that'll be good. Um, thanks. Uh, next on our agenda, and we do this uh, every uh, year about this time, uh, if we have some interest in going to uh, EdRed. EdRed is our suburban advocacy lobby group. Uh, it is over the whole uh, five or six county Chicago area. It's the biggest lobbyist gr uh, lobby group. Uh, we're one of uh, the original members of that group in a lot of uh, districts. They have their annual uh, meeting and dinner on, um, in uh, January, and uh, it is on January uh, 28th this year, which is a Monday, so we always have this conflict on, uh, in January. Uh, so we are recommending that we simply move, uh, what we've done in the past is we just move our board meeting to Tuesday uh, that week uh, as an alternative. Uh, if that didn't work, then we could find an alternative date like you know, uh, maybe another day in the week, but just sliding it over a day is work, and that allows us and uh, any of the board members who are interested to attend uh, the annual Ed Red Dinner. Probably 550, 600 people attend that dinner uh, at uh, Marriott down by um, O'Hare Airport. So if that's okay with you, then our recommendation would be to move the January board meeting to Tuesday, January 29th, and that we would need a motion to do that. Motion to reschedule the January board meeting to Tuesday, January 29th. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Huber? Aye. Luce? Aye. Bunstead? Aye. Rooney? Aye. Baxton? Aye. Grudy? Aye. Hessel? Aye. All right, motion carries. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so we'll make sure that we send a reminder out to you and us um, as we get closer uh, to that meeting. Um, before we do number four and number five, which is really an update on the LHS pool and the capital projects there, and then um, um, the three major capital projects that uh, we have been discussing and we've got some more detail on, uh, I did want to make the comment, there's a lot of back work that goes into, or prior work that goes into possible construction. And so uh, Mark and his team and Dan and sometimes Bryant and occasionally me as well, We'll have to do some back work with villages well in advance of a, um, any proposed capital project that we may or may not do uh, for timing on uh, permitting, going through different committees, uh, those types of things to prepare the villages. So um, last Wednesday, Dan actually attended a uh, committee poll meeting at Vernon Hills um, and talked about the three proposed uh, capital projects at Vernon Hills, the cafeteria, um, expansion to classroom addition, and uh, the gym and slash dance, uh, the second gym and slash dance facility um, there. So we just want the public to understand that we need to do that work several months out. Uh, so if uh, a um, project is approved or projects are approved, we the village has everything in place and we have everything in place to move forward in an expeditious manner uh, to get um, those projects done. So um, if you've seen anything in the newspaper or you watched you know, the Vernon Hills committee meeting last week on cable, uh, you would have seen Dan there. Uh, that does not mean that the board has approved uh, the projects yet. Uh, we still have to go through that process, uh, but we wanted to make clear that we need to go with some detail uh, in front of that to ensure that if the projects are approved, that we are able to move forward uh, again in a very um, orderly manner, in a timely manner uh, to leverage construction cycles, et cetera. So with that said, um, Mark, you wanna give us an update on uh, the pool at this point? Uh, things are going well at the pool. Uh, inside, um, 
We completed all piping for the overhead drainage for the roof on the south side of the aquatic center. Um, we completed the uh, concrete on grade, on grade slab pours for both locker rooms and the storage area on the north side. Um, they're working on um, installing the gutter around the pool, so that's being uh, welded together. So, so good progress there. Um, obviously, they're still working on undergrad, uh, underground piping and uh, plumbing roughness um, throughout the uh, slab area. Um, on the mezzanine, the mechanical mezzanine on the east end, there was a crane lift uh, last Wednesday, and they lifted the three large air handlers up onto uh, the mezzanine. Um, and uh, the ductwork and, and uh, pipe mains are being uh, installed up here on the mezzanine. Um, uh, we passed uh, the pressure test for the water main, so the uh, water main for the pool and will loop around the front of the building uh, was chlorinated and uh, has a pressure test uh, in order to uh, activate it. So we'll, we uh, passed the uh, Test and uh, IEPA approved it, so they can use the water. Um, and uh, the clearing was done for the expansion of the parking area on the west side of the property, um, as well as Comcast was in. Uh, as we uh, found out that their cables were too uh, close to the surface uh, for any grading, so um, the directional mooring was uh, completed. Uh, one cable has been connected. We're scheduling uh, for downtime for the fiber optics uh, when it won't interrupt school. Yep. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, and I, I think we mentioned the BHHS capital projects. Uh, the uh, administrative team spent time with the board at our uh, finance and fil facilities and finance meeting. Uh, last Monday with uh, some more detail in terms of uh, numbers. Uh, we're working on a plan right now to give the community the opportunity to come in and for us to talk about those projects uh, more and ask questions. And so that will be forthcoming uh, pretty quickly. Um, and that would be not only for the uh, three uh, potential projects at Vernon Hills, but also repurposing uh, the pool uh, at Libertyville for uh, future use, and we're still waiting on some um, more specific numbers to come in on that project uh, because we've been uh, mostly focused here for the last uh, couple of months on um, the uh, breadth and depth of the uh, Vernon Hills project. So uh, all that will be forthcoming, but uh, everything looks, uh, appears to be moving. Uh, we appear to be at a good place to have that discussion uh, in the future. So unless you guys want to add any, anything to that. Okay, good. Okay, uh, Pat, believe it or not, that concludes the superintendent's report. We have no FOIAs this month. Okay, all right, consent vote agenda is listed. Uh, we reviewed that uh, last week in committee. Can I ask for a motion to approve the consent vote agenda as listed? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Booth, Moose. Aye. Lundstedt. Aye. Rooney. Aye. Batson. Aye. Rudy. Aye. Castle. Aye. Huber. Aye. All right, motion carries. Uh, Facility and Finance Committee, Chairperson Luce. Yeah, tonight uh, we're going to be voting on the adoption of the certificate of the 2008 tax levy and the accompanying resolutions as listed on the agenda. Uh, resolution to adapt the tax, tax levy for 18. Resolution to lever, uh, levy certain special taxes for leasing educational facilities or computer technology or both and for temporary relocation expense purposes. Uh, three, resolution to levy certain ta special taxes for special ed district IMRF purposes. Uh, four, resolutions to lever, uh, levy certain special taxes for special education purposes. Five, resolution to levy certain special taxes for tort immunity purposes. Six, resolution to levy certain special taxes for a working cash fund. And seven, truth and taxation certificate, uh, cer certification of compliance. Mm -hmm. So uh, Dan, do you wanna just give a brief overview of the key aspects of this? Sure, uh, so essentially what you have before you is our levy, and right, as, as we've talked about before, when we say, we say levy, but really what it is, it's actually 
several different levies, but we just kind of saved levy to really mean all of them combined. Uh, so those are there for you. So the levy uh, increase at this point is a 2.91% increase over the previous year's um, extension, which is the amount of money we were, we were approved to get. Uh, so that we were basically asking for 2.9% more. However, uh, you won't get the 2.9% because of the property tax extension limitation law. That limits the growth of property taxes by the lesser of CPI or 5%. And since that law has been in effect, CPI has not been over 5%, so it, it defaults to CPI, which for this year is 2.1%. So for existing properties, it goes up on average 2.1%. Uh, new property is estimated in there about 14 million of EAV and new property that uh, we can tax. There's other new property happening in our district that are in TIF zones, TIF districts that we can't access for the next several years. Uh, so we try to take that into account. and. Um, at this point, what we're estimating based on the 2.1% uh, CPI increase and the new property is approximately around a 2.5% increase over the previous year's extension. But for existing owners, the average would be 2.1 on the aggregate, but for each individual owner, that may or may not be true depending on how your own assessment has changed relative to the whole group. So if the whole group is going up on average 3.4%, which is what we're estimating right now, However much an individual property goes up by more or less than that average will determine whether or not they actually see a, an increase of more or less than 2.1%. So. so do I have a motion that for, to move forward with the board adoption of the certificate of the 2018 tax levy and the accompanying <coughs> resolutions as we just listed? So moved. Second. Questions or discussion? Do these all in one vote? Yeah. Okay. Just so this is kind of why I asked that earlier question regarding the this, the compensation 102. So Rita did a nice job telling me 102 to 109. So that's about a six and a half percent somewhat compensation increase. What portion of our total expenses are compensation related? You know in give or take 70 percent about 70 percent so as a CFO how do you how, how does that work I, I don't get how if this is our primary revenue source and it's only going up to let's just say two and a half for the sake of discussion how, how do we finance the you know that that compensation there how do you do that yeah, so that number going up 6%, I don't know that the compensation went up 6%, there's more in that number. Okay. But the general idea of how do you do, how do you treat compensation that goes up more than what the CPI is, I guess, is a general concept. Uh, the practical reality is you either cut down in other areas, so you don't spend it on other areas, or what actually ends up happening is um, people leave the district for various reasons, most of the time they retire. I mean, you replace that retirement with a, you know, uh, usually the, when, you're, when they're retiring, they're kind of at the top of the pay scale, and you, when you replace them, they're not at the top of the pay scale. And so that savings usually ends up offsetting the cost, and so that's how, in, in theory, you can stay within those stay within those guidelines of the CPI increase, but also potentially have uh, compensation increases that are beyond CPI. But basically, so we've, we've had an edict here that we're not dipping into reserves or anything, and we are passing budgets where expenses equal revenues or dollars coming in in this case. Right. So the bottom line is, and I think we had a bus increase last year, 20 something percent that we had to take on. And so if we're really gonna stay, let's say the hypothetical number is 2.5, to your point then, everything else needs to come in less or we're going to have to decrease or cut other things yeah so what a big thing will be is kind of projecting these things out and uh, so i we're working on those projections i can't say i'll have them for you like next month because i feel like november is almost gone um, and then december will be here and then all of that so we're, we're actively working on those because now that and i've gone through the budget process and i've seen every single line item i'm very familiar with with how those all fit together um, seeing those projections forward, I think, are going to be crucial. Uh, crucial in terms of just understanding what the path ahead looks like for us. 
and in terms of even just negotiations that we know are ongoing. So what property taxes are, what percentage of our total revenue, like 98%? What do we get, like 1% from the state? So lucky? It's in your scorecard there. Yeah, I think it was, what was it? 89. Yeah. 89, so about 90% property taxes are. Okay, great, thanks. Any other questions or comments? We have a roll call. Lumstead? Aye. Rooney? Aye. Batson? Aye. Rudy? Aye. Hessel? Aye. Huber? Aye. Luce? Aye. And anything for other? I don't think we do. That concludes the uh, facilities and uh, finance. Okay, program and personnel. Chairperson Benson. Okay, thank you, Dr. Grudy. Uh, we have a number of, let's see, two, four, six, eight, nine or so um, employment um, uh, hires and whatnot to approve here. We can do this in one vote. These were things that uh, were not on the consent agenda because they occurred after uh, we had already put through the, uh, the items on the consent agenda. So. We're looking at uh, some coaching, some education support personnel, and some uh, uh, ESP resignations and their replacements. Um, can we have a motion? So moved. Second. Any questions, comments? Okay, roll call, please. Rooney? Hi. Batson? Hi. Grudy? Hi. Hessel? Hi. Huber? Hi. Luce? Hi. Lundstedt? Hi. Okay, well, passes. Uh, that's it for the um, personnel program. Personnel. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see, no property, no seagull, no ISB. Yet, right? Just, uh, just a reminder for the um, conference this weekend for those who are attending. I'll see you there. Okay. Uh, and then next, we have a motion to convene an executive session. Uh, again, we have three topics. One, collective negotiating matters, five ILCS 122. B, uh, employment of an employee, 5 ILCS 120-2C1. And then three would be that in purchasing of real property, 5 ILCS 120-2C5. And again, no action after the executive session. So we'll to move to executive session. Second. Any discussion? Roll call. Batson? Aye. Rudy? Aye. Hassel? Aye. Huber? Aye. Luce? Aye. Lundstedt? Aye. Rudy? Aye. All right, motion carries. Thank you. Good night, everybody.